Hello, welcome to this video on Bodhicharya Avatara, chapter 6, verse 11. Dukhkanyakkara parushyam ayashashchetyanipsitam priyanam atmano vapi shatrosh chaitadviparyayat. I'll bring the text up. There we are. Dukkan nyakara parushyam ayashashchetyanipsitam priyanam atmano vapi shatrush chaitad Viparyayat. Dukkam, Dukkha, Nyakara Parusham, Ayashascha, Iti, Anipsitam. <clears throat> so, Dukkha, Nyakara, being humiliated, parushyam, harshness, usually in the context of harshness of speech, being spoken to harshly, ayasha, literally unglory, yasha is glory, renown, good repute, ayasha, the exact opposite of that, being held in contempt, or being in disgrace or in disrepute. Ayashascha. Ayashascetis. Ayashas. cha Iti. Iti here is not so much unquote as rather like that's the end of the list. So this word iti, as we know, mostly means thus, unquote. But here it's as if I've recited a list of these well-known things, unquote, all of these things, iti, unquote, and ipsitam, are unwanted. Now let's unpick this. Now before I unpick it, let's just go into the second line. All of these things are anipsitam, which I'll explain in a moment, are undesired, unwanted, priyanam atmano va api, are unwanted priyanam for those that are dear to one. And remember here the use of the genitive, it's nasty for somebody, difficult for somebody, it's unwanted, these things are unwanted for me. In English we tend to say difficult for, unwanted for, in Sanskrit and Pali, we use the genitive. So, anipsitam priyanam, um, unwanted for our loved ones. We don't want them for the people that, that we love. Atmanaha va api, and indeed for oneself. So, these things are unwanted. Priyanam, for loved ones. Atmanaha, genitive, va api, and indeed for oneself. Shatroscha, the cha, shatru is an enemy. The genitive, regular genitive, um, uh, this is a masculine noun ending in an u, and so the genitive ends in an o, o with visarga. Then followed by cha, it becomes shatroscha. Shatroscha etat vipariyat. Shatroscha, literally, and of the enemy, so, and for the enemy. Here, construe cha as meaning not and, but, but. Sometimes there's a, they're unwanted for ourselves, and for an enemy, it's the other way around. And in English, in English, we could say and or but. These things are unwanted for ourselves, and for an enemy, it's different. 
they're unwanted for ourselves, but for an enemy is different. It feels more natural to say but, but in Sanskrit you can have the cha. Cha etad. By Sandhya, of course, chaitad. Etat then becomes etad by Santi before the um, the following v viparyayat viparyaya is something which is a contrary or different or the a turning around just make um, um, put that in the ablative and use it in, in an adverbial sense from oops that fire to me paper from the candle. <laughs> Um, so it means it, it's the other way around. To the contrary, on on the contrary, it's the other way around. Now let's unpick this in detail. Um, I'm pointing out an error that I have made in the in my typescript. Um, I'll do that before going on. See this word, parushyam, harshness. I have put a hyphen after the m, as if it's a compound, because the, the system I follow here, as we know, is I, I put a hyphen to separate compound words. That I put that in by mistake. It is not a compound. Um, if it were a compound, this would be parushya ayashas, which then would become parushya ayashas. Mm -hmm. It's given its full declensional ending, neuter nominative and is not compounded with the next word. My apologies, that was my error to put the to put that hyphen in. Let me just call and let me call up the iPad. So we've got this So parushyam, oops, sorry, why has it done that? Back again. What I accidentally did was to write it as a compound and putting in that hyphen, which should not properly be there, it's a se separate word. If it were a compound, it would be written as parushya yeshya. Back to our text. This nyakara. Literally being turned downwards. That's the image of the you know, being made to lie face down as a sign of sign of you know, contempt and humiliation of somebody. You know, to make him lie face down on 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 the ground. It's the imagery behind it. It's from the root, anch. Uh, that root means to basically to turn or to or to bend. I'll call up Monia Williams with it. Who's the root? Anch, to bend, curve, incline. Also to reverence with inclined body, to 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 honour. A bit like the root num, meaning, which the root meaning is to bend, and then we have um, namas, namo tassa bhagavato, namo namami and so on. 
Um, it's the same idea of bending. So, Namo Tassa Bhagavato in Pali would be Namas Tasmai Bhagavate in Sanskrit using the dative form. So, Anch. And the. Oops, what's that happened? With the pre verbal prefix Upasarga Ni, meaning either in or down. It becomes ni anch becomes by santi ni anch. Let's now make this, or rather use this um, at the end of a compound, or use it as a as a noun. Bring up Monu Williams again. Here we are. So ni anch sink bend hang down. Um, which is what you'd expect to mean, anch to bend, ni anch, bend downwards. Now, as an adjective, look at ni anch. It's an adjective formed here directly from the root without adding any um, any suffix or any any vowel. So, it's just, so in its raw form, the adjective is simply nianch, going directed down, was bent down, and then by extension of meaning, humble, vile, con con contemptible, you know, going around with your, your head hanging, or even being made to lie, on, be, lie, lie on, on your face. So what happens here? There's a rule of Sanskrit santi that no word can end with two consonants. So one of them has got to go. What goes? The n goes here. So that then it becomes niach. No is another rule now that no word in Sanskrit may end in a ch. What happens to a word that wants to end in a ch? The ch becomes a k. Now that explains how we get niach, niach, niak. So, we see it on screen here where I'm highlighting the niak is the masculine, nominative masculine singular form, meaning bent downwards, therefore then humble and then contemptible. Now, niakara, kara from the root kri, meaning to make, just means making. So, nyakara, making humble, humiliating, putting somebody in a position of contempt. That's the nyakara. Let's call up text again. Parusha is a word that originally means... Um, Spotted or dirty, not all lovely white and clean, spotted and dirty, um, and then applied to speech, it means harsh, you know, rough speech, speaking to somebody in a, in a nasty way. So you would have um, parushavacha, um, harsh speech. We will now form um, uh, an abstract noun out of it. So, parusha will form the abstract noun with the vriddhi plus ya. What do we do? Vriddhi of the first syllable, so the ap becomes a, and the final a drops and is replaced by ya. So, parusha. Parusha. That's a, that's a, a regular formation and very frequently found. Uh, we also have the example um, kushala, generally good, also in a, a Buddhist context, frequently used to mean skillful, as in skillful conduct, a conduct that is conducive to the holy life, where we get the vridhi u, the vridhi 
of U is Au. So we have Kaushalya. So Tukam Nyakara Parushyam Ayashash or Ayashaha on its own. Unglory, have I translated it here? You know, unglory, disgrace, dis, disrepute, yeah? Disrepute, so Ayashaha, then with Santi the Ayashah. Um, let's change this to. Um, the Ayashah becomes Ayashah Cha, with the following Cha. Iti, unquote, I mean, end of the list. Anipsitam are undesired. Uh, very often in Sanskrit, um, the undesired can have the forces as strong as if you use a positive word, like horrible, nasty, um, undesirable. Um, it tends to have a slightly weaker force, which simply negate the positive. In English, it tends to have a slightly weaker force, but in Sanskrit and Pali, it doesn't, and indeed in in Greek, it um, it doesn't as well. So, if you say unglory, that is as oppositely powerful, so to speak, as the positive form yesha, glory. So, anipsitam. This is from the a desiderative form of the verb. It's from the root up. Now the desideratives, it's a, a form of the verb which um, indicates within the verb itself the desire to do something. Um, for example, from the root yud. Meaning to fight. If you... Oops, make a desiderative form of it, the stem, you duplicate part reduplicate you, you typically reduplicate just the initial consonant and the vowel and then repeat so that's the reduplicated form youth becomes you youth and you make the stem of the desiderative verb with the, verb with the addition of sa, sa. So, yuyud sa means to desire to fight. And of course, by santi, internal santi, the dh becomes a ta. You make an adjective, so yuyutsati. He desires to fight. In fact, it's an art manipulative of his you you say it means he, she, it is desirous of fighting, wants to fight. So the idea of wanting is now we do in English we have to say um have to use a separate word, e like eager for battle, to want to fight, to be eager. You have to use a separate word. But in Sanskrit, um you can alter the, the form of the verb by the reduplication here and the addition of the, the sa, um, so that the idea of desiring to do something is now inherent within that form of the verb itself. So, you um, yut say, you yut say, I want to fight. Far more commonly than the verb, we have the adjective, where instead of a sa, you put a, a su. So, So, yuyutsu becomes by internal santi yuyutsu. So, yuyutsu. Um, in the very first verse of the Bhagavad Gita, these armies are here described as being 
Yuyutsavaha, in the plural, Yuyutsava, desirous of fighting, often translated as something like eager for battle. You can also make a past participle out of it, whereas instead of the, the sa, you get the sita ending. So if you see a verb ending in some reduplicated root followed by sita, that is a hallmark of the past participle of the desiderative form. Now, there are certain rules for the for reduplication. Um, normally, you just part reduplicate the first syllable. Here, you, you youth is, is, is a good example um, because it's a simple form of reduplication. You take the, not yud yudsu, but yud yudsu, just reduplicate the first consonant, the initial consonant and the vowel yutsu. You have it, for example, from with bud. To awaken. If somebody is seeking to achieve awakening, what is he? His bubutsu. I'll write it in the incorrect form first, deliberately. So bu bud su. Now you can't have a d before a sir, so it has to change to a d by internal santi. Now, here's a little twist. Where you have an aspirated consonant, as in yud, bud, if the preceding consonant is capable of being aspirated, the aspiration is thrown back onto it. That's why, in fact, the correct form is bubutsu. So bubutsu means seeking bodhi, seeking in enlightenment, seeking away, desirous of awakening. Bubutsu. So the aspiration is thrown back if it um, if the preceding consonant, as I say, is capable of being aspirated. Nothing happens in yuyutsu, the aspiration there, the d becomes a t, but the y is not capable of being an aspirated consonant. So nothing happens, the, the aspiration just gets lost. So keep the aspiration, if you can, by giving it to the preceding consonant, if it can take it. Right, so after that digression, we see here the idea of reduplicating. Sometimes the reduplication becomes um, a bit irregular. From up, it makes irregularly, it, it makes an ipsu. So, ipsu, up to, to obtain, to get. Ipsu, irregular alteration of the, of the root there. Ipsu means desirous of obtaining. And very often it's just mean, is used to mean desirous, because when you desire something, you normally desire to obtain something, for example. So ipsita, you can make a past participle out of that. Ipsita, desired to be obtained, or very often just means desired or de de desirable. Negate it, and we have anipsita, new to singular form, anipsitam, as in the last word in our, in our first line here. So that is the explanation of how we get from ap to obtain to anipsitam, undesirable. So, back to text again. So, dukkha, pain, humiliation, harsh speech, disrepute, and disrepute, all of these things are anipsitam. 
Um, you here we could have had a plural. We could have had an ipsitani. There's um, a choice in Sanskrit here. They're both correct. Where you just get a list of things like that. Particularly if it's if it were a list of different kinds of people, for example, friends, Romans, countrymen, you see, then friends, Romans, countrymen, and my little son, you see, then that that would that would have to go in the plural. But where you get a list of non-personal nouns like this, of which the last is um, a neuter, because yeshas is neuter, then the adjective describing them all, or qualifying them all, can go in the singular. That's how we get singular, but the same gender as the last item in the list. So yesha is a neuter singular, so it can be followed by a neuter singular noun but that noun applying to the whole list. I think the more strict classicists, um, and by the time of Shantideva, it was all right. I mean, if Paneni, back around the time, time of the Buddha, had been pronouncing on that, Paneni would probably have said, well, that's actually wrong to put it in, a, in the neuter singular, um, right to put it in the neuter, but he, he would have said it's, it should be in the plural because it's, it's applying to all of the previous nouns. Dukkam, nyakara, parushyam, ayesha. It's this adjective applies to them all, therefore it ought to be in the plural. Um, but, you know, a millennium and a half after Panini you know, laid down his rules, um, that that particular rule had been relaxed somewhat, so you can use the, the singular. It's still got to be neuter, um, because the, um, the last noun in the sequence is neuter. So Panani would have corrected that to an ipsitani. So the, all of these things <clears throat> are undesirable for those we love, priyanam, atmano, va, api. Um, or indeed for ourselves, the va, or, api, even, or indeed for others and indeed for ourselves. I would expect us to see the other way around for ourselves and indeed for the, those we love. But there we are. And the va api, of course, va api by, by Santi. Um, the cha. Um, I feel a little bit hesitant to say that Shantideva could better have used a different particle if he'd used the particle tu rather than cha. I mean, cha is not wrong, but tu would have had more force here. Tu is a, like, however, by contrast. Shatrus tu etat viparyayat. However, for an enemy, it's the other way around. In other words, these, all these nasty things that can happen, dukha, nyakara, parusha, ayesha, they're not under from our point of view they're not undesirable if we see our enemy su suffering them so here this cha is a slightly loose use um, of cha etad this viparyayat is on on the contrary um if i explain this here we are so this um Peri i, peri around the root i to go, so peri i becomes peri, perita gone around. Put the v in front of it, so it's you know, got two upas, upasargas, v and peri, and make it into a past participle. Vi peri ita, vi perita means turned around. Um, in the Bhagavad Gita, in, um, yeah, I think it's even in chapter one, Nimitani cha pashyami viparitani keshava. I see the, the nimittas, meaning the signs. In this context, in the Bhagavad Gita, it means the, the omens. You know, there's about to be a battle. So you see the signs, the omens. The omens are viparitani, turned around, turned away. The imagery of fortune 
having turned its face away. So I see the nimitani viparitani. The verbal noun of i is aya. So vi pari aya by santi vi meaning a turning around. Here, as often happens, the use of the ablative as as um, um, as an adverb. So viparyayat from the turning around. In other words, it's the other way round for an enemy. Shatrushcha, shatrushche tad viparyayat. This is the other way round. The entire thing is the the other way round if it's for for an enemy. And some of you will have had my spiel on Samma and Samyak. Um, the, I'll just briefly mention it again. Um, Samma, which of course we all know from, from the Pali and the, the Noble Eightfold Path, each element of it um, begins with Samma, Samma Ditti, Samma Kamanta, and so on, all, all eight of them typically translated as right, you know, right view, right speech, all the rest of it. But in fact, yes, it does mean right, but there, there's a lot more to it than that. The the anch, this anch root, meaning to to bend or to curve, it's sum, e, anch, sum together, the root e going, anch, curving, bending. So it's filled together, going, bending. It's a coming, a harmonious coming together. It's like you know, the harmonious, holistic whole. So it's it's almost a bit Taoist in, 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 in a way, that you're know, conforming with the Dharma. It, so what you're doing is just right, that's right, that's wrong. What you're doing is harmonious with life, and harmonious and intertwined, harmoniously intertwined and consistent with the with the holy life. A slight over translation, okay, but that is the that's the imagery behind samyak pali samma. So there we are. I will just read it through once more. Oh, where are we? Here we are. Dukanyakara parushyam ayashashetyanipsitam priyanam atmanuvapi shatrush chaitadviparyayat. Once more, very slowly. Dukan, by the way, remember the following end. Dukam nyakara, I pronounce that um as a n. Um, the same point of articulation as the following uh, consonant. So, Dukanyakara Parushyam Ayashashetyanipsitam Priyanam Atmanovapi Shatrush Chaitadviparyayat. And that's all on this video.